Hey everyone, so the next video is going to be on Bayesian statistics. This is kind of an interesting video because these videos are being recorded for statistics courses taken at the University of Utah Department of Mathematics. And as of this date, which as you can tell is uh, September 11th, oh, September 11th, uh, 2020, uh, there really isn't much uh, teaching of Bayesian statistics at the math department. And in fact, the main text for this class, uh, for the Math 3070 class, really does not discuss Bayesian statistics. It does discuss Bayes' theorem, which Bayes' theorem does kind of present itself automatically as a form of inference. Uh, but not really discussing uh, the further to you know going further down the rabbit hole of bayesian statistics this is basically like when i recorded this when i wrote this lecture this was basically the only lecture on bayesian statistics uh in the math department to my knowledge so uh, consider this a treat we're going to talk a little bit about bayesian statistics in this video which is certainly going beyond just the r programming part and going more into a statistical method, and in fact, some statistical theory, some really deep theory. Ba the difference between Bayesian and frequentist statistics, they're not just different methods. They are different ways to think about statistics and how, not just statistics, but how science should be done. So uh, the methods that you guys, if you're watching these videos, I'm presuming that you're learning is frequentist statistics. So in frequentist statistics, you basically consider there being a fixed yet unknown state of nature that you are trying to learn. Perhaps you're trying to learn about the value of a parameter and you consider that value parameter uh, that parameter to be unknown, but it is essentially fixed and non-random. So you're trying to learn about the value of that parameter using data. And a lot of the statistical theory developed is... Uh, developed with the presumption that this parameter is non-random, just unknown. So we de we understand the behavior of these tests be because we know the distribution of the data because uh, the uh, the parameter itself is just, it, 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 it exists. And uh, it, when you're doing, say, a hypothesis test, either the null or the, the alternative hypothesis are true. One of these things are true without any uh additional wrinkles in it one of those things are true we just don't know which and we're trying to use data to learn which of these hypotheses are true right um so if we observe data that is highly unlikely under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true the null hypothesis is rejected on the grounds that it seems unlikely given right, that that the data that we observed is unlikely if it were true and thus we're going to assume that the alternative is true. And this is the school of thought that arose uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, the mathematician uh, Fisher developed these methods. Uh, student William Gossett, uh, William Gossett, uh, he also developed these methods. Uh, he's a very, like William Gossett is kind of who you kind of attribute the t-test to. He's a very interesting character. He was, uh, uh, he was actually a brewer at Guinness and he was developing statistical methods to help Guinness make better beer. And the and the reason why we refer, refer to William Gossett as student is because he was developing these developing these state of the art statistical methods and developing them with Fisher, but he wasn't allowed to publish under his name because Guinness considered these methods a trade secret. So they didn't want rival brewers to know about these statistical methods. So he's published under the name student. Um, so uh, these methods were very popular throughout the 20th century. They remain the dom dominant statistical school of thought. Uh, and these are generally the methods that are taught in introductory stats courses. The alternative to the, to the frequentist method is generally the Bayesian method. Bayesian statistics is arguably older than frequentist statistics, because Bayes and Laplace are some of the pioneering individuals in Bayesian statistics, uh, who and they pre both of them predate Fisher. Uh, and unlike, well, let's see, uh, not just Fisher, um, also Carl Pearson. He's also one of the uh, uh, leading individuals in uh, mathematical statistics. Unlike frequentist statistics, um, where we try to learn about a state of nature that we presume to be fixed, 
the Bayesians view the true state of nature as being essentially random. Now, they may not necessarily say it's random, but they allow us to make probabilistic statements about uh, what state of nature is actually true, which whether that means that the parameter itself is truly random or whether we're trying to uh, think of some alternative way of uh, viewing probability and what we can make probabilistic statements about. At the end of the day, these two uh, methods require different interpretations on what probability means, which is its own video. I actually recorded uh, a, a video about the interpretation of probability that you're welcome to watch, but that's going to be a separate topic. But they treat the, per the parameter of interest as being essentially random and the true state of nature as being random. Uh, so uh, we start, before we collect any data, we assign to, uh, to our parameter or to our state of nature a prior distribution, which reflects our beliefs about the possible values of theta prior to any analysis. Uh, so you may be familiar with, in, when talking about Bayes' theorem, talking about uh, drugs and whether an individual has a disease or not, and uh, well, maybe not. Let's not say drugs, but like applying tests to individuals to see whether they have disease or not. And you have a prior belief of, about the probability that this individual that you're about to test has a disease. So you assign a prior distribution, a, a prior probability to that belief. And then we collect data, which going back to that example corresponds to conducting a test on this person to see whether they have a disease or not. And after you collect data, you compute a posterior distribution which reflects where you believe theta, where, where you believe a parameter is or what the true state of nature is after you have observed data. So what you end up with in the end is a probabilistic statement. You say now the probability after having assumed this data of this thing being true is some other number. Um, so this is going to be the case of the hypothesis testing. You basically say that you never really reject a hypothesis in Bayesian statistics you merely say that one hypothesis is more likely than another. You assign probabilities to different hypotheses. Uh, so you, so, so that means that the Bayesian mode is entirely different from the frequentist mode. With the frequentist mode, you have truth or untruth. With Bayesian thinking, you have varying degrees of truth. You have probabilities of things being true. Uh, so Bayesian methods are heavily reliant on Bayes' theorem, which I'm displaying here. Uh, so we say the probability of a hypothesis given the data is equal to the probability of the data given the hypothesis times the probability of the hypothesis divided by the probability of the data. Uh, the thing with uh, all of that discussion, though, uh, is that's a... Uh, you know, so when uh, writing stuff down like that, this part right here, you always know that you have to divide by the probability of the data itself. So often what's written is the probability of the hypothesis given the data is proportional to the probability of the data given the hypothesis times the probability of the hypothesis. This uh, symbol here, I, I don't really know what to call it. Uh, almost like a like three quarters of an infinity sign. I don't know. But this symbol means proportional to, meaning that two things are equal except for a multiplicative constant uh, that is non-zero. And also we're going to say uh, positive. Uh, so... If H, so so yeah, this is basically Bayes' theorem. It's just you write this without dividing by the probability of the data because you know that in the end you have to do that. So we decided that the normalizing constant is uninteresting for, to the key ideas of Bayesian statistics. Now that said, if you're doing Bayesian inference, you do need to compute that normalizing constant. And one of the disadvantages of Bayesian, Bayesian statistics is that uh, computing the the, the denominator is actually quite hard. So computing that constant that you need, because this is not going to result in proper probabilities. It's not going to actually result in probabilities that sum to one. So you need to divide by some constant, which corresponds to the probability of the data, uh, in order to be able to do to be able to make truly probabilistic statements and be able to actually do some form of inference and and doing that is actually quite hard. That's one of the reasons why, in many ways, Bayesian statistics is the disadvantaged statistical method. It's because uh, you need to compute that that uh, you need to you need to compute often something that's rather difficult to compute. Uh, in the end, 
this probability, the probability of the hypothesis given the data, is going to be the a posteriori belief that H is true. Or it might be a distribution, like a probability distribution. So uh, I would say that, pro that uh, Bayesian methods, there is increased interest in Bayesian methods. Uh, part of the reason why is I, I hope I haven't come across as really just trashing Bayesian methods in this uh, conversation. Because there are some things that Bayesian methods do very well. Bayesian methods are, give an elegant way to update beliefs given additional data and what you should be currently believing. The idea of a prior and a posterior distribution, those like the prior distribution is somewhat uncomfortable because often the prior distribution can involve some degree of opinion. And if two individuals dif with different prior, two individuals with different prior distributions are going to have two different views of the same data set. And that's disconcerting. But one nice feature of Bayesian statistics is the ability to update your beliefs because after you have um, rejected the prior distribution, uh, after you have computed the posterior distribution, that posterior distribution will become the new prior distribution in any future analysis. Uh, or at least that's ideally what would be the case. Uh, the difference between Bayesian statistics and frequentist statistics, there are many different issue, many different uh, differences and arguments one way or the other. This is basically a holy war in the statistical community of which one to use one or the other. Uh, the differences range from philosophical to computational, and I'm just going to leave that debate aside. I am going to, though, discuss some Bayesian statistics with you because, I mean, they are more common and they are nice. So let's go ahead and talk about them. Let's consider a very simple example. This is, uh, bare, yeah, this is in a way, I don't think uh, analysts actually do this, what I'm about to show you, but this should give you an idea of how Bayesian statistics work. So uh, let's consider an example. Uh, we believe that our data is coming from a Bernoulli experiment. Uh, where, in other words, you're flipping a coin and you want to know the proportion that the of uh, times the coin lands heads up. So your data is following a Bernoulli distribution with a parameter P, where P is probably the coin lands heads up. The thing is, in Bayesian statistics, we're going to treat this parameter P as being essentially random. So we're going to first assign a prior to probability distribution to the parameter P. We might say, for example, that every P between 0.05 and 0.95 incrementing by 0.05, each one of those P's are equally likely, in which case all those P's are going to have a probability of 1 over 19 of being essentially true. Uh, so, and uh, this is what would be, no this is our prior probability distribution for the parameter P. And this is known in Bayesian statistics as an uninformative prior, since you're saying that all P's that you are allowing are equally likely. Uh, so after we have assigned this distribution to our parameter P, we then collect data from our coin by performing n flips and counting the number of times coin lads heads up. We'll say that those uh, that the number of flips is S's. So we need to compute what's known as the likelihood. And going back to this uh, formula uh, for uh, Bayes theorem, this part right here, but the probability of D given H is known as the likelihood of the data D given that H is true we need to compute that likelihood for the data. So to compute the likelihood, uh, we do so like this. We compute the probability that we get S flips, uh, get S heads out of N flips, given that the true parameter P is P naught, and that's gonna be proportional to uh, P naught to the power of S times one minus P, P naught to the power of N minus S. Uh, you may recognize this. This looks a lot like the probability mass function for the binomial distribution, but it's missing a constant. It's missing a multiplicative constant. Well, we're going to just basically neglect that for the moment. Uh, so after you have combined uh, the, this uh, likelihood and the prior together in Bayes' formula, you end up with a formula for the posterior distribution. So the, so the probability that P is equal to some quantity P naught given that you observed S heads out of N flips, 
is going to be proportional to the probability of seeing S heads out of N flips, given that P is equal to P naught, times the probability that P is equal to P naught. This is the likelihood, and, and the part that's now actually highlighted is the prior. And that's going to be proportional to P naught to the power S times 1 minus P naught to the power N minus S times probably that P is equal to P naught, which we've said is 1 over 19. So this is going to be um, proportional to the posterior distribution. Here's the thing, though. If you add up those numbers for all valid P naught, which are going to be numbers between 0.05 and 0.95, incrementing by 0.05, so 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, and so on. If you add up all those numbers, it doesn't actually add up to 1. So this is not actually a proper probability distribution. This, this constant that it adds up to is not equal to 1. That said, after you've computed the posterior distribution, you could hopefully uh, compute this constant... Uh, in order to find the, uh, in order to normalize this quantity appropriately. So then you would have a proper posterior distribution that you, could then be used for inference. So in general, this is actually rather difficult to do, but given the way I've set up this problem and the fact that we are doing things in R, it's actually not going to be that hard because we're just going to use the sum function. All right, so let's uh, go over here. I wanted to use those... Uh, notes because well i mean we uh we really need to see the math rendered all right but anyway now let's get to our r session so i'm going to create a function called the plot pmf function this is a function for uh pro plotting probability mass functions okay so you can just read through that code if you're curious on how that works i'm not sure if i i think i did use this function in other videos so it's the same function from before uh i'm going to change my plot settings uh, let's uh, promote this. Okay, uh, so change how our, how we're making our plots. Uh, we might actually change where the plot appears. Anyway, uh, so now uh, let's go ahead and uh, consider our uh, prior distribution. Well, first off, the possible values for P are going to be uh, numbers between 0.05 and 0.95 incrementing by 0.05. So here you actually see the possible values for P displayed. Uh, so we say that any one of those numbers are possible. Uh, the prior distribution of P is going to be the number of possibilities divided by, uh, it's going to be one divided by the number of possibilities. So this is what we end up with for our prior distribution. This is basically one over 19. Uh, and if we were to plot the prior, uh, this is what we would get. Uh, plot new, figure margins are too large. Okay, so we need to actually promote this and try this again. Okay, there we go. So that's our prior distribution. Let's suppose that we flipped a coin 20 times and then out of those 20 flips, we observe 12 heads. So now we need to compute our likelihood function, which is going to be, uh, proportion, uh, which is going to be proportional to P to the power S times one minus P to the power N minus S. So this is going to be uh, our likelihood with uh, up to a constant. Okay, and then after we have the likelihood, we can start to compute our posterior distribution by multiplying the prior with the likelihood function. So after we do that, here's the thing though, the posterior as it is currently isn't actually normalized. It's not a proper probability distribution. So we're going to divide the posterior by the sum in order to have something that actually is a probability distribution. Now we have a bunch of numbers you can't really tell what those numbers are saying, but if you were to plot it, okay, now we actually are, now we're actually cooking. This is actually something of interest to us. So now we have a posterior distribution describing what we believe the true probability P is. So notice first off, um, this first off, notice the shape of this distribution. It's centered around P equals 0.6, which just happens to be the sample proportion of successes. Uh, so that is the single most likely uh, number for P, which in Bayesian statistics is referred to as the maximum a posteriori uh, estimator so or estimate for P. So in this case, the single most likely value for this parameter P is 0.06, which corresponds to the sample proportion, which makes perfect sense. Um, so we that said, we can use this posterior distribution to make a number of interesting statements. For example, if we wanted to determine whether this coin is biased in, in the favor of heads or not, 
uh, we could actually compute the probability that this coin is biased by computing the probability that the coin uh, that the probability of getting heads is greater than or equal to 0. 0.5. So uh, the probability that the coin is at least that the probability of getting heads is at least 0. 0.5 is going to be 0. 0.867. Uh, the probability that it's less than 0. 0.5 uh, is going to be 0. 0.13. So that would so we read that thinking that uh, basically now we have two. Uh, possible states of nature that the coin is maybe super fair and that the probability of getting heads is at, is at least point of, point 0.5 or one half and we have the probability that the coin is less than fair so if you're like if you're thinking of a game where you win whenever you uh, get heads or not and uh, what we observe is that the probability that the coin has the probability of getting heads of at least one half that's 87 percent which means that it's quite likely that um this coin uh, has a probability of seeing heads of at least 0.5. Uh, now that said, it doesn't necessarily mean that the coin is not uh, it, that the probability of getting heads is less than 0.5. You know that's that's unlikely, but it's not necessarily impossible. Uh, 0.13, a probability of 0.13 is certainly uh, a that's an event, an event with that probability is certainly possible. Okay, so that's how hypothesis testing would look in a Bayesian framework. Uh, another thing that we can do with a, with a Bayesian statistics is compute what are known as credible intervals. These are the Bayesian equivalent of a confidence interval. Uh, so uh, a credible interval is an, is it is going to be. Uh, let's see. Let's actually go over here. Uh, okay. So so a credible interval is an interval such that the probability that this parameter is in this interval is equal to c. So that actually sounds like what people want to say for confidence intervals. You want to kind of say the probability that this parameter is in the confidence interval is uh, C, at, but that's actually not true, right? That's not how you interpret confidence intervals. If only because in the in, for confidence intervals, which are frequentist constructions, this parameter P is uh, not random. So it either is or isn't in an interval with probability one. Right, so we just don't know which is the case. But in this case, when we're treating this parameter p as being random, we genuinely can say that the pro that the probability that this parameter p is between a and b is our uh, is our probability c that we specified. So the trick with this situation is that um, when trying to compute a credible interval here, uh, we are dealing with a very discrete distribution. So if we wanted a 95% credible interval, we can't actually get it because of the discrete nature of P. We have forced P to be discrete, which is a little unrealistic. A real Bayesian would not actually describe P in the way that I have here. I have only done this for the sake of simplicity. Uh, a real Bayesian would be saying that the prior distribution of P is some beta distribution and, and blah, 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 blah. But basic, but so that would not actually be a problem in a real, uh, in, in like actual Bayesian statistics. But here, that is an, an issue that we can't actually get an incredible interval of ninety-five percent just because of the discrete nature of this distribution. So what we're going to do is find a number is basically find an interval such that um, the probability that this parameter p is in this interval is at least. 0.95 so probably going to be larger but as small as it can be um with uh, uh with it's as small as it can be if it's not 0.95 so in this case we end up with two boundaries for our credible interval with this code what we're f basically saying is that the lower bound of this interval is going to be 0.35 and the upper bound is going to be 0.8 and the actual probability of being in this interval is going to be 0.989 or about 99 percent which basically means that there is a 99% chance that this that this that the probability that this coin gets heads is between uh, 0.35 and 0.8. So, uh, all right then. Uh, so that's the uh, conclusion of this lecture, and uh, I uh, wish you all the best, and uh, see you later.